for a third day in a row. Ontario has met less than half of its daily testing target, and that comes as the province begins its gradual reopening. Premier Doug Ford says the low testing numbers, quote, shocked him, but he says Ontario has a plan to ramp up testing. Is that good enough? What is Ontario risking by reopening without a strong testing regime up and running already? Dr. Michael Warner is the medical director of critical care at Michael Guerin Hospital in Toronto. He joins us from that city. Hi, Dr. Warner. Good to see you again. Nice to see you as well. I have a bunch of questions on testing, but first I just wanted to check in with you because we have been talking to you throughout the, the pandemic about what it's like on the front lines, what you're seeing in the hospital. It's been a few weeks now. Where do things stand from your perspective, at least on the front lines? So when we spoke earlier, we were concerned about a deluge of patients with COVID-19 coming to the ICU and, and overrunning our resources. Fortunately, that has not happened, but we have had a steady uh, number of patients coming almost daily to our ICU uh, with COVID-19, but at this point in time, we're able to manage the number of patients safely within our current resource envelope. Where from, I, I guess, for, or how would you describe from your perspective, I mean, we keep hearing about the epidemic, epid I can't say it, the curve, <laughs> pardon me, it's too late, <laughs> the, 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 the curve and where we are at at the curve and whether we're over the hump or whether we're entering a, a period where, where things are flattening. Obviously, it depends on where you live. Uh, what are you, like, from a perspective of the front lines, where are we on that curve? So, so I think what you said is key. It really does depend on where you live, not only in the country, but in the province. So the situation in Toronto and the situation in Northern Ontario are completely different. And that's why a one size fits all to opening up the economy may not work in a province like Ontario. Um, my hope is that we're on the flatter part of the downward part of the curve, the first curve that is. We don't know if and when there'll be a second curve. And that's why we need to just be this is this is far from over, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, and the way things are going, I'm expecting a slow burn for perhaps 18 to 24 months of us being in this COVID era. So, so let me dig into that a little bit with you, and, and specifically the capacity that the province has to figure out whether that reopening can happen and to what degree, and, and on that, the issue of testing. So we found out today, for example, in the past 24 hours, Ontario's conducted 7,382 tests. The goal is 20,000. That's just 37% of that goal. This is the third day in the row where the numbers have not been very high, short of, let's say, 70% of the goal. Is that significant? I think it's really important. I would have hoped that as we open up the economy, our ability to test and test broadly would have increased in lockstep with that decision. Uh, that's the way to get ahead of this and to make it more likely that the steps that have been taken to open up the economy will be okay from a healthcare perspective. And I think there's very little hope we'll be able to open up the economy further and durably as we get our testing capacity up to where it should be and beyond. Is that testing capacity of 20,000, for example, is that a comfortable level? Let's say they were meeting it. Let's say they were doing 20,000 tests a day for a couple of weeks. Is that an, a more accurate picture? Like, would you feel okay with that? I think it all depends on what the goals are. I mean, I think the goal should be to open up Ontario as quickly, but as safely as possible, and not to let this linger. So the more testing you do, which includes surveillance testing, that means going to a Costco and testing everybody there just for the heck of it, to see where COVID is hiding in our community so we can flush it out, isolate those patients, contact trace them, etc. So we have to be proactive instead of being reactive. And the way you're proactive is by testing aggressively, broadly, and having accurate data that can inform a healthcare plan that then informs an economic ramp-up plan. Uh, you mentioned contact tracing, and I'm wondering what you know and, and what your experience has been like contract tracing, tracing rather for, for known cases of COVID. So what you just said is really important. So we're contact tracing for known cases of COVID. That means when someone's test comes back one to three days after they've had the test and public health gets that test, they have, I guess, within 24 hours, a goal of contacting 90% um, of those cases, the goal of hopefully being 100% down the road. Uh, I think what's interesting for, for people to hear is that as a physician on the front lines, I can tell if someone has COVID within 10 to 30 minutes of seeing them in the emergency department or the ICU. I can tell based on their x-ray, based on their uh, lab tests, and based on their history. And I think that it would be great if frontline healthcare workers could shorten that time lag by informing public health that we have a patient in front of us who we think has COVID, not wait for the test result, because I don't wait for that test result to make my diagnosis, so that they can start the process of contact tracing immediately instead of waiting. Because time lags, a lag in time rather, can lead to lives lost. 
And I think that there needs to be a better connection between what we're seeing on the front lines to help public health do their job effectively, be used as an asset by them uh, to more effectively uh, contact trace. So that I've had yeah, just, just I've had personal experience where I've spoken to family members of patients of of patients who have COVID in my ICU two or three days after they've been diagnosed, and they're asking me when public health is going to call them. And then I do the public health education on the telephone with them about how they should be self-isolating. And that, that's, that's not acceptable, and, I, and I'm hoping that that will change in the future. Has there, have there been any conversations about changing? That's, that's pretty, I think that would surprise a lot of people that there, that communication doesn't instantly exist. I can tell you it surprised me because when I'm calling to give a family member an update, I'm not expecting them to ask me when public health is going to call them. I'm actually glad that they do, and I'm happy to do that, to give them that, uh, that information. But it, it begs the question, uh, you know, where are the other holes in the system? Because we can't have any holes if we really want to open up the economy quickly to get uh, people back to work. There, we, we need to aspire to have the best public health care system possible. We need lofty goals. Uh, mediocrity is not acceptable. We really have to identify where the gaps are and fill them. And the frontline health care workers, me included, are, are happy to help in any way we can. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time as always, Dr. Warner. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.